Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Inverkip, Skirmerley and Weems Bay Church. It's great to be back leading worship today and a special warm welcome to anyone who's watching online. And for anyone who doesn't know, my name is Lindsay Graham and I'm the pastoral assistant. I've just got one quick announcement. So the Passover meal, which is next Monday, there's been a change of venue. So we're going to hold, hold that at Inverkip Hall this year. Um, and at this point, I'd like to invite Ella to come and read the edict for us. Um, before I begin the edict, I'd um, just like to let you know that Rita Carmichael is in hospital, taken in a few days ago. She is improving and she'll hopefully, hopefully be out in a day or two, so we're all thinking about Rita. And here's the edict. Um, <coughs> Notice is hereby given that in view of the vacancy in this congregation of Inverkip, Skirmerley and Dweens Bay, the Kirk session is about to make up an electrical, electoral register. The electoral register is a list of those who will be eligible to vote when the time comes to elect a nominating committee and subsequently in the election a new minister. If your name and current address are already on the communion roll, then you automatically will be placed on the electoral register. You need take no further action. If you are a regular worshipper here, but are still a member of another congregation and you wish to participate in the election of a minister, to this congregation of Inverkip, Skirmerley and Wees Bay, then you should arrange to hand in to the roll keeper a valid certificate of transference before the kick session meets. If you are a regular worshipper here and not a member of this or any other congregation, then this kick session can add your name to the electrical register as an adherent. If you wish the kick session to consider this, you should obtain a form from the roll keeper Complete it and return it before the Kirk session meets. The Kirk session will meet in Inverkip Church on Wednesday, 20th of March, 2024, at 7.30 p.m. to make up the electoral register. This is signed Karen Harbison, intermoderator. And for those of you who don't know, I am the role keeper. So I'll hand you back to Lindsay. Thank you. Thanks, Ella. <clears throat> So let's begin, as we always do, with our call to worship, which today comes from the lectionary psalm, which is Psalm 51. O Lord our God, restore to us the joy of your salvation. Grant us a willing spirit to sustain us. Amen. Now our first hymn is 577, Christ Be Beside Me. Let us pray. Loving God, you shower us with blessings, fill our lives with love and with all good things. 
Yet, in our weakness of faith, we frustrate you by depriving ourselves of the riches you so freely offer. We do not seek, so we don't find. We do not ask, so we don't receive. We get too concerned about the fleeting moments and fail to grasp the treasure that is eternity. Forgive us our shallowness and our limitations of understanding. Teach us to set our hearts on things which truly satisfy and that you so yearn to share with us. Lord Jesus, we pray, we, sorry, we praise you for showing us how to live. We praise you for your ministry, your love and faithfulness to your calling. We thank you for your willingness to face death head on so that we might find the true meaning of life. We stand in awe of your sense of purpose, your inner courage and deep faith that gave you the strength to follow the road to Calvary. Lord Jesus, forgive us that we have received so much, yet give so little in return. Help us to avoid the easy route, but to follow the way of the cross, to deny ourselves, and in doing so, find all that we will ever need and more. Now we join together to say the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> Last week in Sunday school, one of the little girls, Ellie, um, sang a solo for us and it was just lovely. Um, so is anyone here any good at singing? <laughs> I'm not going to make you sing a solo. <laughs> Does anyone have any special gifts or talents or can you play an instrument? A few people. Um, so it got me thinking a little bit about skills that we have. So you might be a good listener or someone that's really, really good at numbers and figures. Or you might have a good sense of humour. Or you always know what to say to cheer someone up. My daughter, Sarah, is very good at art and it was her last ever school parents' evening last week. And I was just blown away at all of her artwork that she had on display. So she's doing a lot of creative subjects in sixth year. And there's a common theme through all of her work, and that's her faith. So in photography, she's taken lots of amazing pictures at Bible camp and her and all her friends have this little war paint on their faces and it's all about going into spiritual battles. Um, she's also done an amazing shot of her friend Neve out in the Clyde and she, she looks like she's walking on the water so that's about um, being able to trust. Um, in art she's also done lots of paintings and collages using doves and spirit and fire and a beautiful stained glass. Um, she's also made props and in woodwork she's made light boxes to display all of this work that she's done and she's put little bible quotes in them. She's also done a beautiful video in media studies about how we find ourselves and our identity in God. So, not that I'm like, biased in any way, but I think it's absolutely brilliant. But what made it so good was it was, it was such a surprise because she'd kept it all very quiet. And in school, I was the least arty person you could ever meet, but I did really enjoy my music. And by far, I was at my happiest when I was in the orchestra in Girls Brigade. And we got to go to Singapore for two weeks and praise God, you know, with our instruments. And a couple of years ago, I was in a praise band with two of my friends called Heaven Sent, I know. <laughs> um, and it was just such an amazing time. So I thought, why did I enjoy those times so much? 
Um, so not only was I using my gift and my talent, but like Sarah, I was using them for God. Um, so, and I know that in this church, you all do the same. So from the finances to welcoming people, leading worship, playing instruments, driving people to church or to their appointments. So being able to drive, that's a, a good skill. Um, visiting each other, home baking, writing poems with a gospel message, using your technical skills. I know I'm probably missing people out here, but you all have so many gifts and you're just so kind and you use all of those talents for one another and for God. And it's amazing actually to see what goes on in this church behind the scenes every day. And in today's reading, we hear of Jesus being lifted up to high priest status. So these were not his own words, but the words of God spoken through the prophets. And importantly, even though he is great, the greatest man that ever lived, in fact, Jesus remains humble. So unlike some celebrities who are very good at something and then the power kind of goes to their head, Jesus is doing all he can to remain humble and do as God says. And he allows God to use him and be glorified through him. So we should never feel like we're keeping our talents hidden, but rather use the great skills and the talents that you have that make you unique and give them to God. And in that way, he will continue to bless all that you do. So we'll sing our next hymn, and it's This Little Light of Mine. Our first reading is from John <coughs> chapter 12, reading from verses 20 to verse 33. John 12, verses 20 to 33. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, 
and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will be my servant also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honour. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was, th it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come from your sake, not my, for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of the world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The second reading is from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5 to 10. Hebrews 5, verses 5 to 10. So also, Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you, as he says also in another place. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears. To the, to the one was also able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he, su he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest, according to the order of <coughs> excuse me, Melchizedek. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Now we will join our hearts and voices again as we sing our next hymn, which is 465, Be Thou My Vision.
you. <laughs> is it us now? Yeah. Do you know, we're speaking about humility and I almost stood down there to do the sermon today. <laughs> so I probably should have. <laughs> um, so our reading from the book of John transports us to a very busy cosmopolitan Jerusalem during the Passover festival. Philip himself with a Greek name was probably able to speak Greek or at least understand it better than the other disciples. Philip was approached by some Greek people who said, we want to see Jesus. Philip was your typical staying under the radar sort of disciple. He wasn't one of the followers invited to go up the mountain to see the transfiguration. In fact, he was quietly in the background in most of the scenarios that we read about, making sure everything goes well. Not so much a leader, but a team player. If Philip were an elder in our new church today and asked to join one of our new committees, he wouldn't be on the worship team He'd probably be setting up chairs, putting the heating on, and at the end, locking up. Philip was the one wondering, how are we going to feed these 5,000 people? Arguably, Philip's most famous line was, come and see. When asked, can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip never missed a beat and said, come and see, see for yourself. But Philip brought so many people to Christ through his steadfast dependability. He didn't bring them to himself, he brought them to Jesus. And I just loved that idea of speaking the language. So whether it's schools chaplaincy, street pastors, youth clubs for teenagers, prison ministry, or visiting people with dementia, The best pastor is one who can speak in ways that people understand. And I also loved the request of the Greeks. We want to see Jesus. And you know, it's a request that we're probably subtly missing. You see, your friends and neighbors, your enemies even, are crying out saying, we want to see Jesus. They might not say it in as many words, But in this uncertain world, we all need to see Jesus. It feels like there's an appetite at the moment for things of a spiritual nature and some very dark things that lure you in as just a bit of harmless fun. I think everyone is seeking meaning to life and answers post pandemic. Without saying it, people want to see compassion from us, not for us to react as the world does to any minor inconvenience. And they don't even have to show up to worship on a Sunday. You might meet someone out in the village, or for those of you who are at home, someone that comes in to look after you. How we conduct ourselves shows people Jesus. When Philip and Andrew go and relay the message to Jesus, he replies, the hour has come. So if you were at soul searching this week, we heard the words of God spoken through the prophet Jeremiah hundreds of years before. And he said, the days are coming. Now Jesus says, the hour has come, it is time. Incidentally, Philip was present at the wedding at Cana, which was Jesus's first miracle. Remember, his mother tells him to help the host by producing more wine. But Jesus says, this is not my time. But now, as soon as Jesus hears that the Greeks want to see him, he says, it is time. He says, the hour has come and the Son of God will be glorified. It must have been a very strange thing to hear. The very humble Jesus using words like this, signifying his imminent glory. A complete shift in the way that he has spoken up until now. Jesus explains when he is lifted up, all will see him. 
So he's talking about his imminent death and resurrection and ascension. He was preparing his friends for his departure. Not only were they going to lose him once, but twice. But this is what he came here to do. The reading from Hebrews explains things further. It talks about the sovereignty and the humanity of Christ. His purpose was about to be fulfilled, but importantly, it's not his will, but God's will. And that's where we find true glory, true greatness in a life of submission to God, of being humble, trusting and being obedient to our Father in heaven. There was a very hard word in that reading for you there, <laughs> Melchizedek. So who is Melchizedek, you may ask? So Jesus is described as a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So this means the king of righteousness. And Melchizedek is a very mysterious high priest figure that is mentioned a way back at the very beginning in the book of Genesis. And the more I prepare for these sermons, the more I can see this golden thread of Jesus all through the Old Testament, right from the start. And I actually had goosebumps reading this. It put me in mind of the Last Supper. So Genesis 14 says, Melchizedek, a priest of the Most High God, brought bread and wine, brought it to Abram and said, Blessed be Abram, my God, most high and blessed be God most high who has defeated your enemies for you. Remember in today's reading Jesus says it was for this reason I came to this hour. The prince of this world meaning the enemy will be driven out when I am lifted up. Jesus went on to explain the kernel of wheat has to die for it to produce more seeds. So the human side of him is increasingly anxious about what is to come. He says, my soul is troubled. But he reassures himself and us by saying, this is what he came here to do. It's not about taking the easy road. Those who hate their life will be given eternal life. Those who love life will lose it. So it's about self-sacrifice, death to self, to allow God's plans to be fulfilled. Getting rid of any pride or selfish ambition or injustice that we feel and letting God rule, <clears throat> emptied of us to be filled with him. As we move towards a nominating committee and seeking a new minister, we must remember that person like Philip and like Jesus even, is to be a shepherd. So it's not about leading us to themselves, as some more charismatic preachers do. It's about leading us to God. Jesus is well aware that he is about to take center stage, if you like, and it's not really his thing, but he's doing it for God and for us. A true hallmark of someone you can trust is someone who means what they say, who fulfills their promises consistently. And Jesus reveals his goodness and faithfulness to the disciples claim by claim, hour by hour. There is no backing out now, the time has come. So this is the start, the, the countdown, sorry, oh, to Good Friday. So the fulfillment of the prophecies of old the perfect sacrificial lamb is now ready, ready to be offered to God. But it can also be interpreted as the time has come for everyone to know the truth of salvation that comes through Christ. Today is a day that many of us remember our Irish ancestry and we celebrate the feast of St. Patrick. In planning for today's sermon, I could think of no better example of a man of God. Of course, Patrick wasn't Irish at all. Born in Britain in 360 AD, he was actually a Celt. 
And he was the man that God chose to bring the Christian faith to Ireland and beyond through his evangelism. Kidnapped as a teenager and sold into slavery, Patrick was exploited and he led a hard life, caring for sheep out on the exposed hillside. Broken and humbled beyond belief, one night looking out over where County Antrim is, Patrick had a vision of God. And with God's goodness reflected back at him, he realized that he was a sinner, for all have fallen short of the standard God sets. But he also learned that Jesus had taken his sin away. He was able to escape his cruel master and return to Britain. But, and this is the even more amazing part, very soon after, he returned to the land of Ireland, the place that he'd been used and abused. And I don't know anyone who could do that, which is further proof that God was acting through him. He was giving him the courage to go. But how was Patrick able to convert the Druids who were heavily into witchcraft, paganism and superstition? Well, a bit like Philip, because of his time there, he was able to speak the language. I'm sure at the time of his abduction, Patrick would have been terrified of his captors in a strange land away from home. And yet, a few years later, he returns to change the hearts of a nation. You see, God makes every situation sent to harm us for good. He was an incredible missionary, speaking to people humbly and in words that they understood, baptizing a fifth of the population and explaining the Trinity to them. God turned his situation around in ways no one could envisage. But Jesus states, in order for the seed to produce more seeds, it has to die. So if you're afraid, if you think you're at rock bottom on the ground, alone in a dark place, breaking open, unraveling even, and it feels like you're dying, what if you've been planted? All of that is exactly what a seed goes through before shoots of new life appear. Getting rid of distractions and finding silence and solitude to pray is a great way to let God reveal himself. In today's passage, Jesus says, the voice that you heard was for your benefit, not mine because Jesus already knows the will and the heart of God. But we need to cultivate a life of prayer, listening for God and seeking God's face. The hymn that we opened with today is based on St. Patrick's breastplate. So it was a prayer said for protection, Christ beside me, before me, behind me and within me. We sometimes think that we're going it alone, but that's not true. God may ask a lot of you, but he never asks you to do it yourself. Obedience to God, even in the most challenging times, creates opportunities for us to share his light with others. In God's upside down kingdom, serving him is where true greatness lies. It's not in titles or friends in high places. It's our willingness to take up our cross and follow him. In stark contrast, the Pharisees, who we're going to be learning more about over the next couple of weeks, not all of the Pharisees, but most of them represent everything that is opposite to humility in religious leadership. Arrogant, Ignorant, self-important, insolent scoffers, full of pride and vanity, and importantly, hypocritical. Acting very different in private and in public. 
and unable to look inside and examine themselves. They strive to make themselves look and sound important at the expense of others. I'm sure some were very well-meaning and thought that upholding the law was a way of doing God's will. But Jesus is not afraid, and neither should we be, to call out what he sees as some very dangerous people. It doesn't matter that they believe in God. Even the devil believes in God. But it's that they're so arrogant that they don't fear God. The Pharisees think that one day they'll charm their way into heaven and elude the judgment of God, just as they have avoided accountability in this life. But remember, the first will be last. On the day of judgment, woe to anyone who professes to be doing God's work, but serving only themselves. Jesus reveals his true greatness and glory around this time, during the transfiguration. Peter, James, and John are with him on the mountain, and he takes on his heavenly form. He took his friends there to be eyewitnesses to his true identity, his glory and majesty. Importantly, it's not done in public. It's not for the benefit of the crowd. It's done in secret with a few close followers who will go on to testify in his name. Jesus is not a show off, but God glorifies him from humble craftsman to high priest and even king. Saint Patrick humbly serves God and goes from slave to saint. So we aren't to be like the Pharisees and seek to elevate ourselves. Years after the transfiguration, Peter wrote his account of it and added, all of you, clothe yourselves with humility. Humble yourselves that he might exalt you at the proper time. Those who give money to the poor and go on to brag about it or pray loudly for everyone to see putting on a show have already had their reward. But those who quietly work doing things for others, doing things with humility without seeking approval of mankind will be rewarded in heaven. The others will deceive themselves saying, hell is not real and if it is, it's not that bad. But in humbling ourselves, in order for God's greatness to be revealed as Jesus did, we don't have to gloat when our enemies finally get what's coming to them. As St. Patrick did, we don't seek revenge. He bravely went back to save the rich people who had abused him and the poor people alike. Matthew says, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. So we don't need to worry about what anyone else is doing. We should just do what we know is right in our hearts and let God deal with others. In the same way, God turns everything sent to hurt us for good. And he will deal with those who have used his name to glorify themselves in much more just and fitting ways than we can imagine. Proverbs says, a man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. So let us follow Christ's example. Any skills of communication, any gifts or talents that we have, use them to bring others to God. Use them to show compassion and mercy to those who hurt you. And most of all, remember, it's not even about us, it's about God. So today's take-home message, there's four. One, we are all called to discipleship, to feed his sheep and testify on his behalf. Two, we all have a ministry in how we conduct ourselves, especially when we've been wronged. People want to see Jesus in us. Three,
True greatness comes from humility. And lastly, four, we are like seeds. We need to break down completely to produce more. But at rock bottom, Christ is there, beside, before, below, above, and within. He is never going to ask you to go through something he hasn't already overcome. God loves us so much he wanted to walk among us, learn our humanity and our ways. He wanted to speak into our hearts in a language that we understand. Take our punishment and deliver us from evil forever. The time has come to show Jesus to all. Amen. And now we'll continue with our fourth hymn, which is 111, Holy, Holy, Holy. Let us pray. Lord God, we dedicate now our offering to you, that you may bless this money for the ongoing work of your church here and at a national level. We pray that it is used wisely to further your kingdom, help the poor in spirit, and always used for your glory. We ask that you will use us too our time and our talents for your work in any way that you have need of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we come to our prayers of intercession. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the many people in our lives who love us, teach us and show Christ to us. 
Thank you for our gifts and talents and the grace to say everything we have or had comes from you. And that even when we are not at our best, you love us just the same. Thank you for all those who have gone before us in the faith, preaching and evangelising and softening even the hardest of hearts with the news of your great love and sacrifice. Thank you for your protection from life's difficult people, for wisdom and discernment, keeping us safe from the tactics of the enemy and the strength to overcome and face another day, even when we've seen rock bottom. Thank you for your son, Jesus, coming into the world to experience all that we live through each day, quietly humbling himself and doing your will, being an example to us all. We thank you that he did not just accept death for our sake, but he chose it, knowing the agony that was to come. He gave it all willingly for us. Such love and humility is too much for us to comprehend. So we simply say thank you and offer our lives and all that we are in obedience to you. Lord, we pray today for all those who we find difficult to love we know that you make the sun to rise and the rain to fall on the evil and good alike, on the just and on the unjust. We just have to trust in your healing love that at the end all will be well. We pray too for the ill and the bereaved and all those longing for answers and uncertainty, all those facing results and the unsettling uncertainty of change. Lord, we lift up Muriel to you and ask that you surround her with love at this time. And we think of Marion, of Rita, Gloria, Anne, Margaret, Bill, Etta, Helen, Bruce, and many others who are unwell at this time. <coughs> Lots of people have family members unwell and going for procedures this week, and we ask that your healing hand be upon them. Let's take a moment of silence as we bring our own private prayers to God. Lord God, help us to remember you have never left us yet and we have no reason to doubt you. Strengthen our faith as we seek to do your will. All these things we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now we join together to sing our final hymn, which is going to be sung to a, a different but a very familiar tune that is suitable for today. So the tune is London Derry Air and we sing 154 How Great Thou Art. <laughs>
Arise today with the strength of Christ's protection over us. Arise with the predictions of prophets, the preachings of apostles, the deeds of the righteous, and most of all, the hope of the resurrection. And may God bless you and those whom you love and those whom you struggle to love this day and always. Thank you.